thought I'd match the picture. <laughs> Good morning. It's 11 o'clock central, and that means it's time for 11s is with Lisa here at Genealogy Gems. And I'm the Lisa part. I'm the Lisa Louise Cook. And we have our live chat audience here. Let me pull up chat. Our live chat audience is here with us once again today. They are from all over the world. And I tell you, you know, I do my best to share what I know about genealogy with you, try to help you grow your family tree. But they do a, which direction? This way? They do a great job of kind of sharing their collective knowledge with each other here in the live show. So, you know, if you're watching the video replay uh, after the live event, I hope that you'll consider looking at your schedule, seeing if you can fit us in at 11 o'clock on Thursday mornings, 11 central. Join us live. It's a lot of fun. And these gems, they know a few things. <laughs> They're awesome. And they share their knowledge with everybody here. And it's just a really uh, fun kind of get together each week. So today, what are we talking about? Well, we're going to talk about digitizing our stuff. And you know what, whether you, we know it or not, we are all creating digital archives. We may not think of ourselves as a digital archivist, but we really are. And um, do you ever wonder if you're doing it right? <laughs> I have over the years, you know, you wonder, um, am I using the right formats? Am I scanning this right? Do I understand what the terminology is? Well, you're not the only person who feels that way. And you know what, Huge archiving on institutions like the Library of Congress, they've wondered the same thing, except they can throw a lot of money and a lot of manpower at that question. And one of the reasons why it's a challenge and why they have to make such an investment in that is because technology keeps changing so much, right? Uh, I teach a lot on how to use Google to find things online, and we talk about first and foremost, just know it's going to change. It keeps changing well tech across the board just keeps changing. And uh, that does present a challenge to all of us. Audio is a great example of that. You know, um, I, I got started in podcasting. And the big question was, well, what format am I supposed to make my audio files? Or if, if you're interviewing a relative, and you're trying to create something, what file format? Well, you remember cassette tapes, and, and eight track tapes? And uh, LPs, vinyl LPs, those are now coming back. They're retro, all the rage. Uh, before LPs, 78s. Do you remember this? No, you're not old enough to remember. That. <laughs> you know, you might know what this is, but you're, you're not old enough, I know. It's an Edison Ambersol, um, Amberol cylinder. This was like the original audio format. So we know that that keeps changing and we need to keep up with it. And guess what? My guest today is going to help us do that and with info straight from the Library of Congress. So let's get started. According to Mike Ashenfelder, genealogists need to know a couple of things in order to create the highest quality digital files that they can pass along to future generations. Things like best practices for preserving a variety of file types, uh, understanding the best way to scan your documents and your photos that will endure the test of time, and efficient automatic file backup and storage practices. Oh, you've heard me hammer that here on the show. But we want ones that involve little or no effort. Mike knows a lot about these things, and he has uh, written a book called Organizing and Preserving Your Digital Stuff, Easy Steps for Saving Files Like the Library of Congress. And he knows that because he worked at the Library of Congress for 16 years. He is here today to uh, talk about how to apply these professional best practices that he has gained through his uh, experiences to help you get your precious files into really great shape. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I'm glad you're here. You know, uh, we were talking before we got started here and saying, well, I've covered some of this stuff uh, on the various, on the podcast, here on the YouTube show and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't think you can ever really cover enough. And digital preservation is kind of an evolving art form as well. File formats continue to change. And oh, I know yeah. that the Library yeah. of Congress had a huge initiative a decade or two ago 
trying to put some, some, um, guidelines around getting things a little more uniform. Uh, and so the industry has evolved. Yeah. And, and, uh, it'll continue to evolve. Technology evolves. Um, and, um, when you take a file, like, uh, uh, your camera takes JPEG photos, um, my, I, 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 my iPhone, uh, my, uh, yeah, the camera, the, uh, the iPhone, uh, it takes something called HEIC and I'd never yeah. heard of that up until we got this new camera. Um, but it's another contender and there will no doubt be another one further down the road. Um, the point of, uh, of my book is, is, uh, not that specific. Um, it's that you should save all files in the highest quality so that you can pass them along to future generations. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And there will always be new software. There will always be new files to save. Something might, uh, uh, uh be better than JEDCOM files. You never know, but basically it, it, it comes down to saving, organizing it and saving things as best you can. Exactly. And I know that you've been doing that for many years. Tell folks a little bit about, um, uh, your work at the library of Congress and, um, what you learned there and, and how you're bringing that to folks through the book? Well, the Library of Congress, as I was telling you earlier, um, they were funded by the government in 2000, I believe, to study digital preservation and to study digital preservation along with uh, other institutions. So they pulled in other institutions, shared information, and of course that was 22 years ago. So at this point, cultural institutions all had the same basic practices. Um, at the library, I, uh, I wrote about and interviewed a lot of sub subject matter experts, and uh, there are different details that vary from institution to institution or project by project. But essentially, it always comes back to, um, let's say, for example, if the library got a digital collection, if an author passed and, and uh, the Library of Congress got their, or, or the Smithsonian got their hard drive, among their other things, um, they would uh, take the files off of the hard drive. They would not compress them. They would name them in a certain way to make them findable again. They would add metadata to make them easily findable again. And they would back them up in two different places, you know, on site on their servers and then off site a hundred miles away somewhere else. Or even when it comes to something like uh, Amazon, their servers are dispersed around the world. So you're, backup files can be, you know, they'll always be available. So they'll right. always be available. So the work that I did, uh, especially uh, in, in the, uh, the later years that I was there was, was geared towards individuals, how that applies to individuals, how that scales down, how you just get the, the files off of your phone or off your computer and, you know, make them findable again, as you have done in lots of articles, you talk about findability and file naming, and you talk about compression as well and why you shouldn't compress and uh, what it does to a file. And, uh, um, and then backing it up in a couple different places. Right, right. Well, you talk about um, in the book, creating a digital archive and kind of addressing all of these different types of files. I, I know uh, genealogists, gosh, we're creating GEDCOM files and photos and videos and um, digital documents. We've downloaded lots of kinds of things. Um, but isn't kind of creating a formal digital archive, that sounds like a lot of work. Is it a lot of work? Uh, initially, and, and actually that's a scary, there's, I wish there were a better way of saying it. It's, it's, that's why I had, I titled my book, digital stuff. You know, it is an archive. You are, you are, uh, creating something that you're going to tend to and, and, uh, uh, keep organized over the years. Um, you've yourself written about or talked about how to organize things on your hard drive. Um, and when it comes to organization, um, I don't, recommend any one way because different people organize different things. You might organize files in folders by year or by subject. Um, so it's kind of up to you how you organize. Um, but the, the, the idea behind good organization is to make this stuff findable again. You know, when you pass away and whoever gets your work, 
uh, you want to make it so that they make it, they can easily figure out the structure of your, your, your work, you know, what, what, what is where. Right. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, and let's take it further. Let's talk about, um, you were saying that these cultural um, institutions, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, they have a lot of responsibility for all these kinds of uh, different files as well at a much bigger scale. Um, can you name a couple of the key best practices? What did you see that they kind of adopted that works well so that they could decide, here's how we're going to name things, here's how we're going to structure things. What can you pass on to the everyday genealogist to kind of help them figure out that starting place? How do they start making some of those initial decisions? Well, compression, starting with compression, um, as your listeners may know, compression is just that. It's taking a file and it's making it smaller. But when you compress any file, uh, the, you're, you're, you're squishing out some data. You know, your, your photo might still look good and the file size will be smaller, but you're squishing out some data. Oh, yeah. And there will always be the possibility that years from now, that original file, you could do something greater with it or something better can be done with it. So you always want to keep the original and uh, cultural institutions will have the original, let's say in the case of a, a photograph, a TIFF file, um, in the case of an audio, uh, audio recording, a, a WAV file, and they'll make derivatives. They'll make compressed versions and put them online so that they'll load quicker when you visit the National Archives, when you visit the Smithsonian, you could see the, the photo quicker. Um, and so that would apply to consumers as well, to average, average folks. You know, if, if you take a, if you take a, if you have some, especially if you have some um, valuable photos of a special moment you know, with a child or a wedding or something like that, um, you want to have, you want to keep the highest quality version. Just take it off your camera and back it up, put it in your archive on your, on your hard drive, uh, uh, and if you want to share it, if you want to put up on Facebook, if you want to share it, um, you know, Facebook, well, that's a whole other thing. A, a, a TIFF file would be uh, uh, pretty large. The original file that comes off your phone would be pretty large. Uh, but, so you can compress it and make a small version um, that you can email. There you go. Uh, and, 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 of course, Facebook does compress that stuff. And if somebody liked that photo and they wanted to download it, they're going to be downloading this smaller compressed version. Um, and you can always share the, the tip, the larger one. If you have a relative who says, Oh, I really love that. I want to have that. That's you know, my great grandmother. You have the original. So there's the original and the derivative. Great. So that's a first, that's a great example of a first kind of a best practice, which is um, the type of file type you're going to do that's uncompressed. That's going to be larger and kind of your um, main version of this file. You mentioned TIFF, which might be new to some people. We think of JPEGs when we think of photographs, but uh, a TIFF would be an uncompressed, larger, you know, raw file that's going to be the main one we might take copies from and make these other versions you're talking about. And then you mentioned on audio, which kind of is something I'm very familiar with. People think MP3s, but that's the compressed version. It's the wave that would be an yeah. uncompressed. So if we recorded an interview with uh, our grandfather, we might want to make sure we've got that raw wave uncompressed file. So it's interesting. There's just, sounds like there's these files that, that I've been kind of preaching a little bit here on my show. It sounds like that would be also the choice perhaps that one of these institutions would use as well. So we're in the right. Ballpark. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Keep the original. Keep the original and uh, and make a make a copy. And and it, that applies to if you want to uh, modify a photograph. If you have a, a, a Photoshop or a free photo mm -hmm. processing program like GIMP, um, uh, and you want to crop it or something like that, you never never touch the original because you might be able to do something else with the original down the road. Um, and you ask about naming. I didn't see. Any, there may be one naming convention, but I didn't see any one naming convention. Uh, one that came up a lot was naming a file with uh, the year, that w with the date. So the, the file name would start with the uh, 
two-digit day, two-digit month, and four-digit year, and then maybe an underscore, and then the name of what what's in it. The name always helps um, um, find the file again. It helps make it. So, so there's a, there's an organizational side with the putting the date on it, and then of course naming the file helps uh, make it findable because you search by keywords. Exactly. Well, and I think about all the old family photos that we're gathering. Oh gosh, Mike, we've got lots of them as genealogists. So I, I tend to kind of focus on just that year because they go back so far. If I start putting date first, I might end up in different orders. I like that the fact that the, the, the year kind of forces things into a timeline, you know, if you will, mm -hmm. of all your photographs. But it sounds like what you're saying too, is that we can make those decisions that there is no one right or wrong way, right? We can just do something and maybe be consistent about it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And findability, Lisa, your, your whole thing is research and, and making something easily findable. Uh, that's what it's gotta be important yeah. for genealogists. You know, if you, if you have all these files that you've amassed, you know, you want to, you want to make them findable. You want to find them again easily. And, and also I, I know that you've, talked about metadata in, in other programs. I was going to ask you about metadata. Yes. All right. So metadata, <laughs> metadata can frighten people because yeah. I've heard it explained as data about data. And mm -hmm. honestly, to me, that doesn't, that doesn't say anything. That's, that's <laughs> gibberish. Um, uh, metadata, if you, if you were to look inside a photo file, um, um, you would see, uh, all the code that makes up the photo, and it wouldn't it, it, it wouldn't make sense to you. It's 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 all different kinds of um, uh, uh, programming representation. But at the top of the file, there's a little area where you can put plain English stuff. You can you can um, type in a description. Now let and me stop you. Can, let me ask you. Sure. Are you talking? Yeah. About, you say the top of the file. So is that like? I'm on a PC, I'm going to right click on my photo file and go to the properties of that file. Is that the little container we're talking about? Exactly. Okay, exactly. good. So and, we don't have to so have a you... special fancy software program to do this. No, okay. not at all. PC and Mac. Yeah. PC and Mac. There's a way to click and, and add information. And what that does is, is uh, PCs and uh, uh, Windows and Mac, they both index the contents of your uh, of, of what's on your computer. They go through and they kind of catalog everything on their own. So when you search your, your uh, computer for something, you're not only looking at, let's say a document, you have the word uh, spaghetti in, the, in a document, you know, it'll find that word document. But if you have it in a file name, part of a file name, you know, the date and then the underscore spaghetti, it'll find that. But it'll also find the text that's inside metadata. Ah. Oh. That gets indexed too. And so if you don't have a good file name, but you remember that, uh, that something happened at Niagara Falls and you took the time to add a description inside uh, Niagara Falls, you know, do a search on your computer, it'll find the photo regardless of what it's named because of the added metadata inside. And you know what I love about that is it doesn't, it, it helps you not have to make some big, long, complicated file name because you're trying to add all this is my ancestor in this place and this time you can put yep. this kind of in the back end is the way you're describing yep. it and the computer still finds it absolutely and awesome. and uh, another thing that cultural institutions uh, uh, are taking advantage of is that phones especially I'm, I'm i'm sure the cameras do it as well i haven't had a digital camera in a while but they add additional metadata Mm -hmm. about the conditions under which the file was taken, including where it was taken. Yes. So, so if you have a photo, a, a recent photo and you're, you're, you know, this is my grandmother and you want to add metadata, it was at this party and she's in the frame with, with uh, uncle Bill and, and aunt Ronnie. Um, and then that's all you put in that file also has information about where it was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey taken at three o'clock on, uh, you know, January 1st or something like that. So metadata is pretty important. And, 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 and cultural institutions will add this descriptive metadata to describe what's inside. And it's easy for genealogists to do that too. And, and, and photos carry a lot of other 
important metadata. And, and it, well, I, one of the exciting things is I think in time, programs will get more sophisticated so that uh, uh, there's the stuff you add, but maybe you'll be able to search all your stuff for uh, events that happened in, uh, in Krakow, Poland, you know, your relatives in Krakow, Poland, you know, uh, based on the metadata that's inherent in the, uh, in the photos. Right. Yeah. It's when I talk to people about putting videos, like if they upload your home movies on YouTube, if you want somebody to find them, you have to concentrate on the title and the description. And it's the same kind of thing as what I hear you describing is that photograph, uh, your computer can't look at the picture and know what's there, but it can read more than just the title. It can read all this data that you can kind of type in the back end. I'm, I'm seeing that more and more when you visit and look at images like at the National Archives and those kind of places, you can see where somebody has entered that data. So it's a little bit more time consuming, right? But it's worth it. It is, it is. And also um, tags. tags, tags are yes. full of metadata. Yeah, so you can just add tags. Um, the, the, the apps for phones are getting better. They're not quite there yet, but it seems to be an obvious need. Some of the photographers, professional photographers I've talked with over the years, you know, just shake their head and whoa, because you can't just tag or add metadata to a photo that's on your phone, but it's, it's not rocket science. And I, and I think that in time there will be apps that help you do that. And only that you don't have to get all, uh, you don't have to, uh, sink in the quicksand of metadata, you just add a description or add a tag and it'll always be there. It'll travel with the photo. Do you use any special um, software or apps on your computer to be able to search it beyond what the computer does? I, I know I've used one I talked about here on the show called Master Seeker, and it's just a free little open source app. But what I discovered found was it it's really fast. Are there any others that should be on our radar? Oh, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. And I don't know. I do the, um, just the usual search, right click and search. Okay. That's, that's as so deep the as metadata probably serves you very well. You <laughs> don't, don't need all the <laughs> yes, extra. Yes. Well, let's now, another to... thing. I... Oh, sure. No, go on. Well, Please. I was going to ask you another thing about something else. So if you want to add on to this, yeah. I'd love to hear. No, no. Well, well, at cultural institutions, again, there was the idea of backing up. So um, I know you'll probably get to that. Yes. Well, in fact, that's where I was going to go is we talking about backing up our stuff and protecting it. And I imagine uh, you kind of started to talk about it where, you know, they would make a copy and then they'd have it off site. Let's talk a little bit about backup. Um, sure. Do you have a backup program that you like using on your computer and ah. what should people looking for? Oh, don't tell me you don't yeah, have same. one, right? No, it's the same one you use. It's Backblaze. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I, an engineer at Apple recommended Backblaze. Um, there's, so, all right, so let's say that you went through all the work of creating your archive. You have a folder on your, on your computer and there are folders within folders where you put your, your photos and your recordings and your documents and your JetCom files and, um, and then you want to back it up. Well, um, I think sticking with cultural institutions that, that there's a local copy and I like having a hard drive nearby because you could just grab it, just takes a second. Yeah. Um, but, there, uh, but as far as having a second copy, you can't beat online and you could go totally online if you wanted, if you wanted. Um, uh, and there's kind of two things to look at there. One is automatic and one is manual. Um, you had a program about the internet archive. And the Internet Archive uh, will open. You can store things there. If you had, uh, if you had gigabytes and gigabytes of, of, uh, of uh, genealogical uh, uh, files, you could go there, create an account, and store it over there. That's a manual way because every time you, uh, you uh, change, every time you add something, you have to remember to go over to the Internet Archive and, oh, yeah, I have to you know, add this over there. Um, there programs like um well google drive mm -hmm. will look at your drive and you give a permission of course and that brings up a whole other thing about how much you want to you want uh 
programs to be looking at the contents of your computer, but that's, mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. But with Google Drive, you give them permission and they will constantly back up the stuff in your genealogy archive. It's constantly backed up. Um, you can set that up and I have it set up. So I have a hard drive here and I have Backblaze uh, backing up my hard drive and I have Google Drive uh, doing it. Now that it's a bit of overkill, but if something happens, and I will tell you a story in a moment, it's backed up off site. Right. Um, the thing about online stuff is that, you know, it could be a disruption and it could be something with your Wi Fi. You know, you can't get to it. It's really important. Um, you know, things could happen. So it's nice to have, I think, a local copy and a remote copy. That's a great idea. Oh, uh, so, how that applies it, and again, how that applies to institutions is they do that. You know, the. Uh, the author papers that I was talking about, and once they're once they're taken in and cataloged, they're stored on, let's say, a server, and that server might be backed up onto a tape drive, but also that server is backed up off on, on a remote server. So they have on-site and off-site as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of people for so long just had like a a separate external hard drive. And they would plug it in on the first day of the month, and then they'd do a manual backup. But, of course, the problem is you have the potential of losing something for the next 30 days, and you have to remember to do it. And the other thing I think a lot of people don't think about is they can break, right, their mechanical items. And I heard you tell a little bit of a story of that you've had one or two break over the years. Yeah, 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 no, four. <laughs> <laughs> And I should know better. I swear to God, I've been to college. You know, I, I, I should know better. But uh, so the first one was, uh, it was just a single. So, so, so right now, I'll jump back in a moment. But right now, there are solid state hard drives that are kind of like a big thumb drives. There are no moving parts. But they're also spinning disk drives. There's literally a disk that spins it's mechanical, and if you do something to uh, to, to uh, disrupt that, like drop your drive, you know it just breaks. The mm -hmm. disc doesn't spin. You can't get your stuff. And uh, I did that to my first one, and I don't even want to think about what I lost. So then I went with the institution way and had a backup drive, but it was two drives connected to each other. And I had to remember if I put it on one to put it on another, and that got to be tedious. Mm -hmm. So then I found out about... Um, backblaze or automated uh, automated backup, and that's where I have this um, system of putting everything locally. You know, when I'm done at the end of the day, just dropping it onto the hard drive. And, and you know what? There are also programs that'll do that for you. You can um, you can have a, a your genealogy uh, uh, folder on your desktop, and you could tell certain programs, uh, "Hey, put it over my hard drive." And you can tell Backblaze, hey, back up my hard drive all the time. So th it can be automated. And yeah. that's the point is that you really, once you, once you create your archive, you don't want to keep working at it. You know, it's, it's hard enough to organize stuff. But once you get it organized, you can automate it so it'll take care of, yourself, yeah, take care of itself. So uh, the third hard drive uh, I dropped um, while I was writing the book. Oh, no. <laughs> Writing about hard drives and blah, 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 blah. And, and you know, you get clumsy, right? So I, I trashed that. But fortunately, it was backed up. My stuff was backed up online. So I bought uh, a solid state drive. They're expensive. They're about twice the, the price of a spinning disk drive, but it's insurance. Yeah. You know, they, they even tell you in the, the disclaimer when, uh, when you go to buy one that you could drop it from a height of five feet and it won't. It'll, it'll be fine. There's a little bit to that story, too. Just two days ago, uh, I was in, um, <laughs> I have my, and, and I sent you a photo of this. I have, I have my, my solid state hard drive attached to my computer. Um, it, so so it's, not, it's not hanging loose on the desktop somewhere. It's kind of always with the computer, which seemed to be a pretty smart thing. Well, just two days ago, I snagged my foot by accident in the charge cord for the laptop. The laptop dropped on the floor. Fortunately, it worked. Everything seemed fine. And I noticed last night that the uh, USB end of it, of the solid state drive, was bent like a dog leg. Oh, <laughs> so no. I bent that. Yeah. So um, 
I don't know what the point of my story there is, but. Well, didn't your daughter help you out though to to put a fix on that? No, she well she she helped me attach it. Yes, she she crocheted, she crocheted a little crocheted thing to yes. a, a little yeah a little patch uh, a little pouch to put the uh, spinning disc drive in. I just have to, you know, remember that that uh, even though I could drop the drive, it, there's always something breakable, you know. So in this case, it's it's the the cord, and I just have to buy a new cord. Well, I like the idea of having one, a second backup, particularly for photographs. I think about all the effort that those watching, you know, who have been scanning their photos have gone to, and you can have a cloud backup, but like you said, then you're also dependent on that internet has to be working. Your power has to be up. I lived through a two week freeze in Texas last year, which made me realize water and electricity are not a given. <laughs> and there so it'd be really nice. And I like your idea of having the external drive almost a, another backup so that at least, yes, it is in your home, but you do have a second a way to access until the internet comes back up and you can get your one from Backblaze, which um, they also will just ship to you on a terabyte overnight if you want to a, yeah. a drive. So, yeah. um, no, if you, if, if you did want to, to go totally online, I, I so I agree with you. And I, I think that you should have a local, I feel like you should have yeah. a local drive, but you don't, you don't have to. But having a secondary backup, you can put something. Let's say you have your your uh, you sign up for Google Photos, so it automatically backs up all the photos on your phone, um, and you can take out an account with Backblaze or Dropbox to back up the stuff that you have on Google Photos. So you can have a backup of a backup that's totally online. You know, there's Absolutely. no one way to do this. Absolutely. Well, uh, one other thing that you talked about in the book, which kind of falls in this because it really is about protecting your files, which is um, virus protection and just pr what you put on your computer. And I admit I've had it sometimes, and then sometimes I haven't had it when I got a new computer. <laughs> um, do you have a fi favorite virus protection type program? And do we really need one? That is a good question. Yes, I do. And I'm ashamed to say I haven't used it in a while. Um, it's a free one. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to see what it's called. Um, Bit Defender Virus Scanner. That's the oh, one I mm -hmm. use, and and it's free. Um, there are lots of free and paid ones out there. Uh, you just never know. It's insurance. It's insurance. Well, uh, you never know. Just are downloading a lot of stuff. I would guess even more yeah. than the average person, we're downloading lots of files, and most of the time, it's a site we know. But sometimes we get tempted because we come across a site that looks awesome and it looks like it has family stuff on it and they're not always yeah. for real. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, and, I and I there's somebody had out there who's copying all my, um, the, the information around my Google earth for genealogy series, even though they don't have the video files, but they create tons and tons of bogus sites trying to look like, Hey, click here and download this and you'll get it for free. And of course it's the yeah. trap. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's insurance. It's insurance, so you should absolutely use it. Great. Well, the book is Organizing and Preserving Your Digital Stuff, Easy Steps for Saving Files, like the Library of a Congress. Um, so Mike, what are um, your top, let's say, two or three tips and reasons why you think people really are going to be able to use this book and make a difference in preserving their own files? Well, the main thing is that it is. I try very hard, very hard to make it as as non-technical as possible. Um, there's lots of information for information professionals about digital preservation. There's lots of stuff for, for librarians. and um, But for the average person who really doesn't care, really doesn't want to know, you know, I try to um, make it as clear as possible and, and not get off on um, uh, unnecessary technological tangents. And it's, you know, it's one of those books that's it's set up like, um, uh, you don't have to read it from beginning to end. You can just jump in and check out the photograph, the, the section on photographs or digitizing audio. Um, um, and hopefully it's explained pretty clearly. And as I told you before we started recording, I always picture a relative of mine who really doesn't care about technology, but they're smart enough. You know, if you explain it clearly enough, they'll understand. And that's what I tried to do in the book. Good. We don't have to become um, a pro at, at it to be able to do a good job of it. And I like that idea. We've got lots of other things on our minds. We just want to know that we're, we're not making some big mistakes that we didn't know we were making. 
So. Exactly. And, and, and the book should map, it should map pretty closely to what cultural institutions do. Of course, of course, they do a lot more sophisticated stuff and they have divisions, you know, as I said earlier about the engineers, they have, you know, they're looking out for viruses. They have divisions preser for, who are doing the preservation, who are doing the metadata. They have divisions and divisions and divisions. Wow. If it's just you on your computer at night in your home, you know, you don't want to hold, you don't don't want to get bogged down with a whole lot. So, but there there are, in broad strokes, there are ways you could do exactly what institutions do. Well, I agree. Doing something at least is better than doing nothing. And I know our future generations are counting on us. So, thank Mike. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge on this. And we're going to have to all get to work. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Thank you so much to Mike Ashenfelder. You know, uh, we touched on a lot of different ideas in that conversation. So I want to take a few minutes and drill down and emphasize, I think, some of the most important things that we as genealogists want to keep in mind. And then I'll head over to chat and see what I can do to answer a few of your questions. Okay, so, you know, if you want to kind of preserve like the Library of Congress, probably one of the first areas you'll want to be thinking about is your photographs. I think that tends to be the, the place that we're doing the most scanning. And um, that's where a lot of the questions pop up. So let's talk a little bit first about scanning. Um, Mike mentioned that you really want to make sure that you are using the highest resolution available. Now, that being said, uh, when I look at my flatbed scanner and I use the uh, Epson Perfection V550, which I think there's a newer one since then, but um, I've loved their, their flatbed scanners, the resolution can actually go really high. I mean, I, you can literally res do 10,000 DPI. So that's probably not important, but I think the thing is, is to decide what your resolution is going to be. And uh, that will also be dictated by how big you want to be able to print out those photographs later. So um, typically people will look at, you know, something like 600 DPI, you could go 1200 DPI. Um, it's really easy to do a quick Google search and kind of see how the DPIs correlate with the final sizes in which you can um, print something out and still have a nice, crisp, beautiful image. So, but the, the thing we're looking for here is that sometimes without knowing it, and I fell prey to this years ago when I first started scanning my photos, I didn't realize there was a default setting on my scanner and I didn't know a thing about scanning. So I'm sitting here scanning pictures and I think they're like at 96 DPI. That's not going to do me much good <laughs> because it's so small. Uh, it means I can't blow it up to a nice big 8x10 glossy or make changes to it and resave it as JPEGs without losing lots of um, clarity. So you want to look and see what is your scanner set at as a default. And um, I, I won't pretend to tell you the perfect DPI settings here, but I can say typically things numbers you hear might be in the minimum 300, 600 would be great. 1200 I find works really well, um, but you can certainly, um, the most important thing is to decide what it's going to be. Make sure you're set to that and that you stay consistent. And uh, one of the things that they mentioned over the Library of Congress as part of the, um, the final results of that entire big program they did on their uh, looking at the standardization of many of these issues is the highest bit depth available. So 16 bits per channel if possible. And as Mike said multiple times, and probably as the most important thing is uncompressed. And so that takes us to file formats. But let's jump over here and talk file formats. Okay, so there are compressed and there are uncompressed files. And we talked and mentioned TIFF. So that's a dot TIF. Now, normally, you might find that uh, the default setting might be just JPEG. And in fact, when some of those little handy dandy portable scanners came out, people didn't realize that JPEG was all they did. So you bought a portable scanner, you start scanning away, and then you realize you can't get an uncompressed file. 
So you want to set your scanner to a TIFF to get that uncompressed, which means you can make a change and resave it and you're not going to miss, you're not going to lose the um, quality. Now, the standards that you see on the screen, the formats, these are the ones that are part of the 2020-2021 um, standardized list for the Library of Congress. These are the ones they deem acceptable. And there might be a variety of reasons why that they would use different ones. I can tell you that a PNG, which we see quite often, is really a file format that you might want to do more for graphics. So when I created this graphic, this way, <laughs> on my screen, uh, I saved it as a PNG because it's a graphic picture. Um, if I was doing a photograph, I would save it as a TIFF. Unless, as I think Mike kind of alluded to, um, let's say I want to put this out on social media, um, I want to upload it somewhere else, we might not need the full uncompressed, the full com uncompressed version, right? So, and many websites will actually have limitations. In fact, if I upload an image that's too large to YouTube, it'll say, sorry, we have a two megabyte uh, max. You're going to have to make your, your picture smaller. So JPEG would be something that would be easily shareable. It's probably not going to run into size problems, but it's not the kind of image that you're going to want to take into an app and start doing um, photo restoration. Because every time you save that compressed image, you are losing a little bit of quality. They talk about lossy. Well, you don't want to lose the quality each time you do the resave. So when I do my scanning, I scan everything as a TIFF. I have that in my kind of my main archive on my hard drive. And then as I want to use those images for different projects, I'm going to make a copy and put that copy in a folder for that project. And then depending on where I'm going to be sharing out these images, they may have a requirement where whatever the website is or the, the event or uh, the project, they might say we have to have a JPEG. So you might have to convert that. Uh, other acceptable formats that the Library of Congress does deem acceptable and depends on how that material first comes to them when they're archiving are Photoshop, which is a .psd. They also consider that your raw camera file, when you're taking photographs with your digital camera, it has its uh, a raw file, that would be okay. That's going to be uncompressed. And a GIF, which we typically think of GIFs as those little um, image files with multiple images, like they, they do little movements for three to five seconds. Um, so we wouldn't typically save our family history photos as a GIF. So we really want to focus on the TIFF as the main uncompressed file for family history photographs. Now, I think one of the most interesting areas is metadata, um, because this really is, it's, it kind of falls in line with source citation, doesn't it? It's something that we are interested in. We want to know what's the history, what's the background on this photograph, particularly as we're sharing images out to other people. And um, let's talk some specifics about that. First of all, from the Library of Congress, this comes straight off uh, their standards, which is the metadata that they would include typically with an archived image would include the title, who the creator was. So if they're acquiring this photograph from somebody, they're gonna put who created the image originally. If I have my grandmother's photographs and I'm doing digitization of those photographs and scanning them all, I'm going to say she's the creator. She's the one who actually took the picture. And I'm going to do my best to put the creation date. Uh, if you're not sure, if you have to kind of do a kind of an estimate guess, you can always put circa or C along with your date uh, with the year so that you can kind of just give people a ballpark idea when you think the photograph was taken and a uh, place of publication. So uh, oftentimes with our family history photos, this is really where was this taken? And so that would be, you know, San Jose, California, or, you know, Topeka, Kansas, where, wherever it is, you're going to put that place in your metadata. Distributor, that might be you, right? Because you're the one who's, you know, putting it out to the world, getting it scanned, um, putting this together. And so I would consider you being the distributor. And of course, contact information. So if you want to share this image out, you want people to know how to get back in touch with you. So it's kind of nice to know that you can include this kind of information in your metadata. 
So meditate. Well, how do you do that? I, I asked him about that, right? Because we hear about programs out there that help you add metadata. But as uh, I think Kathy mentioned in the chat, um, they're, they're still working on standardization. So we're going to talk about it just from our viewpoint as a genealogist on our own computer. And um, in my case, I work on a Windows PC. So when I'm looking at my file manager and I have my photographs there, if I wanted to add some metadata to one of my family photos, I would right click on the photo. And then I get my pop up menu. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there might be like a command click or something for, for Mac. I'm sure there's a Mac user who can clarify that in the chat for us. Um, but I go to properties. So we want to kind of, in a sense, reopen that container of the image. Right. So we think of a, the image is really in a container as it's saved. And there's kind of a backside to that container where we can put metadata. And uh, think of that as like the source citation for the photograph. So when you click properties, then that's going to open up the container. And this container really has four tabs in it. Um, and so you see general. General is usually the default of what it's going to be opened up to. But if you click the details tab, you're going to be able to see uh, several different pieces of information. Some of it will be automatically filled, but you can go in and edit that too. And so I've kind of underlined some of the key areas. Again, take a look at it, decide what's important to you, and if possible, try to standardize how you're going to say what you're going to say. Right? Are you going to write out the word county every time? Are you going to put CO? Are we going to use the letter C as circa? Are we going to write circa out if we're not sure what the year is? Whatever it is. That's what's interesting is when you look at um, a lot of the records that the Library of Congress has generated out of that huge project when they did that grant, really it was about making decisions. It was about making decisions about what's best, what's going to be most informative, what would be easily understood in the future, and recording those decisions. So you can do that for yourself. You can use some of these ideas as guidelines and maybe make kind of a, um, a guide for yourself. Here's what I'm going to do. Because sometimes we pick up and we do our scanning this week and then two years from now. And we want to be consistent how we're naming our files, how we're entering our metadata. So if you have a guide on your computer that you can turn to and say, I have my own standards and here they are and I'm going to follow this so that it's always consistent. And I think that just makes it easier on you and it makes it easier on people that you share your photos with. So we can add things like the title, um, the subject. Subject would be a great example of something that you might want to more closely standardize. Um, tags. Mike mentioned tags, and so I might think of, I think of tags very similar in my photos as I do in Evernote. Uh, when I'm tagging genealogy notes in Evernote, I'm using places, um, surnames, record types. So be thinking about consistent tags. I got to tell y'all, I, I, I'm almost timid to say it, but I am working on a brand new website. And we're making lots of improvements, getting things again back up to the newest um version of things. And <laughs> my web designer looks at me and says, Lisa, you've got 3,200 tags on your website. What are you doing? I said, clearly, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but actually, those tags really evolved from back in 2007, when I started Genealogy Gems and wrote my first blog post and had to figure out how am I going to explain what this is? And I see a little field for tags. So I just start putting words in there. And every time I or somebody else who was working for me created something, they started, there was no standardization is what I'm saying, right? So it happens to the, <laughs> the best of us. So if you have in your standard guide, kind of a list of what are the tags, what's most important to you, then what are the keywords you think you'll be searching on in your file manager to try to retrieve your items? That's what you want to do and keep it, um, Keep it a little brief. It was interesting. I went through my tags just to give you perspective of the 3,200 tags I had on my website. I got them down almost instantly to about 159. That's still a lot, 
But it shows that oftentimes it was duplication. Some of them were spelled wrong. I kept making different variations of them because I didn't realize I had them. So we don't want to keep restating something in just slightly different ways. Date taken, that's on there. Copyright, I think this is good, particularly if this is your photograph that you've taken, you might want to have copyright information. So you can see it's really simple to go in here and um, mark this up. Interestingly, there's a rating. You can put stars. You know, if you can't bring yourself to get rid of all photos, what you might want to do is you could do five stars on the ones you say are the keepers. No matter who you are, my descendants don't get rid of these photos, but then there are other ones where maybe it's a duplicate or it's a variation of a photograph and you could mark it smaller. Look at, look at what you have available there and decide what, what you need and what works for you. So that's metadata. And we also talked about, I like to do things fast. So I've mentioned this little app before. I just love it. I mentioned it in uh, very briefly in the interview, but it's called Master Seeker. And what I have found is that when I go into Windows and I'm trying to quickly search for a file, I don't like how long it takes. It takes a long time. Master Seeker is super, super fast. Okay, so this is a free app that you can download to your computer. I use it almost every day. It's just faster. It's going to save you time. Let me show you kind of what it looks like here. If you pull up um, Master Seeker, I just click it. It's in my taskbar. I always have it open in the background. And look how fast it is. As I'm typing, you can just boom, 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 boom. You can see exactly which files match what I'm asking for. And here in the directory column, we have some options. Um, I'm going to go to a particular area of my computer. Let's say I've got a lot of files that are kind of matching what I'm asking for. I can say, well, no, I want to go straight into my genealogy folders in the photos and instantaneously Master Seeker says, oh, well, in that area of your computer, there's only four that match. So you can see really fast, really handy. Uh, again, in our show notes for this video, the link is in the description down below here at YouTube. Um, also at genealogygems.com, go and you can find episode 75 and you'll get everything written up. Lots of neat little um, items that you can follow, everything we've been talking about today, and there'll be a link over to Master Seeker. Uh, we talked about cloud backup, and that's super important. I recommend um, Backblaze. I put a link in the live chat today. But uh, also, if you're a premium member, go check out your guide to cloud backup. Uh, that's a video that you, uh, kind of a video class that you can check into. Now we had um, se several questions in the chat, and I want to touch on some I think that will really help everybody watching. Uh, what what about video compression? So we talk about there's photographs and there's um, you know other types of files, but what about video? It's a little different because we typically do uh, .mp4s as video, at least as of this recording. Who knows that would continually changes. You can also do WMVs, which are, I think, Microsoft version, but I always do my video as an MP4. The way we make videos smaller, in a sense, compressing them, and it's not maybe true compression, but it does make the video smaller, is we change the resolution. So if I'm doing HD, I mean, I could do 4K and do 4000, you know, but if I do HD, I'm doing like a 1280 by 720 video. And that's pretty standard. That's what I use here on YouTube. But sometimes on social media, they don't want that big. And really 720 is better for on the web. So the size of your resolution, height and width, that is how you can make your video bigger or smaller. There's also something called frame rate. And um, you can go with a very high frame rate. But if I start moving around, you know how when you watch HD, you see little like, I don't know what you call it, ghosts that are running behind whatever the image was. Um, don't worry yourself about that. Really, it's about the size. Um, keeping original media. Somebody was saying, well, you know, if I digitize this stuff, should I really keep the original cassettes or video, video cassettes, VHS? I've had the same question. And in my closet over there is a box of all the stuff that I had digitized um, a year or two ago. And here's the answer. If I have room, I'm keeping it. So I have room, I'm keeping it, and um, a part of it is just sentimental. I just am sentimental. But if you have fully digitized it and you have backed it up on the cloud, 
then I think you're okay if you need the shelf space and you want to get rid of your VHS, your cassettes, whatever they were. I mean, there has come a point where we don't even have the machines that can run them anymore, right? But um, I don't know. I mean, if I have space, I tend to hang on to those things. Um, bit depth, depth. Somebody was asking about black and white versus color. I had to Google it because I didn't know. And so what I think is interesting is they said here, uh, the color depth of an image is measured in bits, and the number of bits indicates how many colors are available for each pixel. In the black and white image, there's only two colors needed, so this means it has a color depth of one bit. Who knew? All right, let me go back here. <laughs> um, let's see here. JPEG to TIFF. Can you convert from JPEG to TIFF? Technically, yes, but you're not really creating a true, true TIFF, as if you had scanned it as a TIFF. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find there are cloud converters that you can upload a JPEG and it will make it a TIFF. Here's the thing, you're going to get a TIFF to whatever quality the JPEG was. So yes, you can resave as a TIFF file, but it's not like you scanned it as a TIFF initially. And you're stuck with whatever quality you were at with that JPEG at the time that you did it. So technically, yes, but much better to um, do the scanning up front as a TIFF. And does the, the Library of Congress keep track of scanner settings in the metadata? I believe they do some. Um, I saw that. I actually didn't focus on it because it's not as much an issue for us. But you're right. If you take a picture from your camera, your camera is going to add some of its own data. And um, they had, you can do a search on the Library of Congress website on preservation. They have a section there. A lot of that stuff's been archived because that project is over. But um, you could see if they have, I wouldn't be surprised if they have some of their scanner settings in there. And finally, somebody asked about Backblaze versus iCloud versus Carbonite. Okay, I, I did originally use Carbonite. What I discovered at the time, I don't know if it's still the case, was they did not automatically back up video files. And I have a lot. I have home movies I have digitized. I have video I create for all of you. And that's a no-go in my book. And I met the guys at Backblaze um, at Roots Tech many years ago. And I had heard some good things from them in the tech community. As Mike said, he talked to an Apple exec and they were using them. And um, it's really core security, full backup, everything without exception. And in fact, if you plug your terabyte hard drive into your computer, it's going to back that up too as part of your account. iCloud is more also about sharing within your Apple products and that type of thing. So they're not exactly the same animal, although they essentially will do both backup for you. You can do a quick Google search too on backup comparisons. If you want to try it and you want the free trial, I put the link to Backblaze, um, our affiliate link in the chat, as well as in the description on the show notes. And of course that helps support this show. So we so appreciate it. If you want to try Backblaze, you could use that. Time just flies. I had so much fun with you guys all today. You had some wonderful conversation in the chat. I will continue looking through chat and see if there's anything else I can add into the show notes. Check out the show notes because that's your guide to everything we do here. And if you are a premium member, you're going to get that downloadable cheat sheet. So check it out. And uh, I, I should just show you this, right? If you haven't done it yet, subscribe. Put us in your little favorites list here at YouTube. Uh, that, little, that little subscribe button is here on the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. All right. Have a wonderful week. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> Thanks for showing up. It's been fun. And um, I have a really cool interview scheduled for this Friday. So I'm excited to um, share that with you. I never tell you up front because I feel like I'll jinx it and something will go wrong with the technology. and It won't happen. But um, we've got some really fun and interesting topics and guests coming up here at 11s with Lisa. So I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye bye.